Hello and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and in this video I'm going to be talking about A Doll's House, the play by Enric Ibsen, uh, and giving a brief overview of the plot um, and the nature or structure of the plot. Just to be clear, when I say that this video is about the plot of a doll's house. I'm not going to be giving a summary of the plot. We're not going to list the events that happen. I will talk a little bit about some of the events in Act 1 um, and some reference to events in Acts 2 and 3, but that's not the purpose of this particular video. Rather, I want to describe the structure of the narrative, how it is organized in time and space, and how it uses time and space to tell a story. And by looking at those uses by looking at the way time and space unfold in this narrative uh, to develop questions and ideas to understand what's happening and to develop complex interpretations about the play. So that's our goal, not to summarize the events, but to understand how the play is structured so then we can use uh, that to look at the events that happen and ask more uh, insightful questions about them. So to describe the narrative, let's first talk about its time, its setting in time and its setting in, in place. Uh, in terms of time, it's a chronological narrative. That is, from beginning to end is a straight line in time. There's no flashbacks to earlier events uh, or flash forwards to events in the future. It's all just A to B to C. And it's also pretty much continuous. There are some gaps in time between Acts 1 and 2 and Acts 2 and 3, but it's mostly a continuous set uh, a, a time period, and it's in real time, basically. Um, that is, there's no 15 years later, 20 years later, or anything like that. Uh, the time that's passing for us as the audience watching it in the theater, uh, and the time that's passing on, uh, is the same the time that's passing in the world of the play itself on stage. Again, with the exception of the gaps of time in between Acts 1 and 2 and Acts 2 and 3, which are about a day or so. The location, the setting in space is also fairly simple. It's a single location, the living room of a home, and it's an internal space. It's within the home um, and, and domestic. It's not the inside of a, an office building. So the time is also fairly simple, just like the setting, or excuse me, the setting in space is fairly simple, um, and it uh, can be easily described just as the setting in time. Chronological, continuous real time, single location, internal space, so it's a fairly realistic time and setting, and it's a familiar location. That said, we can complicate the narrative structure a little bit, at least. Um, even though it is chronological, there are frequent mentions of the past and future in the play. Many characters mention um, their childhood, things that have occurred to them before, past relationships, and also look forward to things that are going to happen in the future. It's also, even though it is a single time and, and uh, time period and, and takes place over just a few days, it's a charged time of year. It's a special time of year, right? The play is taking place during Christmas. It's not just any day, any week. So that's important. So even though the setting and time is fairly standard, fairly simple, chronological, continuous, real time, there is this complication that the characters are looking back and forward and that the time that they're in has a very heavy cultural uh, symbolic weight. It's Christmas. On the other hand, in terms of setting in space, the location, um, again, even though, especially if we're watching it on stage, it's taking place in one room, in film, they can play with it a little bit and show other locations in the home. Uh, this one space is connected to other spaces. Again, it's connected to spaces in the home, and we see characters coming in and out of different rooms to the, the living room where we as the audience are watching the action take place. Uh, it's also, of course, connected to outside of the home. And again, the characters frequently mention the places outside of the home. There's, they, there's talk of other countries, other locations. So again, just like in uh, the temporality, even though it takes place within a short period of time, the characters are constantly referring to the past and the future. Even though it takes place in a single location, the characters frequently refer to other places. Now, these are fairly simple descriptions and not very controversial. It's quite clear that the play is structured chronologically, that there's no jumping around in time. The events occur 
one after the other, A to B to C. But the significance of the structure is even though these are simple concepts and not very controversial in and of themselves, they identify specific topics to investigate. The relationship between this period that we're watching on stage now and things that the characters talk about that have happened before. Uh, things like the spaces that this place occupies in the present and where the characters have been or where they want to go. It highlights patterns and exceptions to those patterns. And it raises questions of authorial choices. Why this time? Why this particular location? Why not show us these other events? Why show us these particular interactions? And so ultimately this will lead us to topics for research and writing. Let's look at some examples of just first the basic questions that we might get from considering time and space and how they're organized in the drama. So questions of time. When the characters talk about the past or the future, what specific periods of time do they discuss? That is, when in the past are they talking about? Just the day before? Or do they talk about their childhood? Do they talk about specific memories, specific events in the past or future? And what do they say? What are their attitudes that they display towards these different times? Do they reminisce about the past? Are they looking forward to the future? Are they afraid of the future? How do these times compare to the present? Given that this play takes place during Christmas, how does the Christmas context relate to or reflect or contrast the plot? So why Christmas and what is the Christmas, the symbolism, the ideas we associate with Christmas, how do they relate to what's happening on stage? And how does the play depict the Christmas celebration itself? What does it include and what does it exclude? It's not just random that the play is taking place during Christmas, that's a choice. So why? And what of the Christmas time, what events, what uh, uh, things associated with Christmas does the author let us see on stage and what is excluded. In terms of space, well, what is the space like? How does it look? Is it welcoming, comfortable, impressive, cold, creepy, etc.? If we're watching a film or, or watching a play on stage, we can see how it looks. We can see the kinds of furniture, decorations, etc., and how it might feel to be in that space. Who occupies the space? Who seems at home in the space and who isn't? Who's allowed in? Who dominates? Who has authority in the space? Who moves freely about it? Who feels intimidated in the space? Who is not supposed to be there? These are all important questions to understand the dynamics of the relationships that we're watching, how these characters relate to each other and who they are, how they define themselves in this world. What other spaces does it connect to? Who occupies those spaces? Who goes into them or comes from them? What other places do the characters mention? What attitudes do they display towards those places? What do those other places represent? For example, in Act One of A Doll's House, Nora talks about Italy and the South and having to go to the South for Torvald's help. So that's a specific location that has a, a, a resonance, has a meaning, a significance. Not that it symbolizes one particular thing, but it has a meaning for the characters. And so it plays a role in their lives, in their interactions, in the conflicts that they have and that we see. So a brief review. Every narrative exists in time and space. And when we're watching a play or a movie, that's quite obvious because we see it unfolding in front of us and we see the characters in a particular place. And the time and space shape the nature of the story. They shape what kind of action can happen, how the action happens, how quickly or slowly. And so we always just, the most basic question to ask is what is included and what is excluded? What time or locations do we see? What time, events, locations do we not see? Do we only hear about? Those are the basic questions. The, the questions that I was going over in the last few slides were a little bit more developed, but same basic principle. What's there and what's left out? Why did the author choose to include certain things in the picture that he or she presents to us? Let's take a short pause before we move on.
So with these questions in mind, I'm going to go through some moments in Act 1 and just pick out a few specific uh, lines that address these issues of time, the characters' attitudes towards time, the different times that they talk about, the periods in the past or future, and how they feel about those periods, as well as some of the spaces in this play. First, looking for discussions, textual mentions of time in Act 1. I noticed Nora says on page 110, near the beginning of the scene, uh, the beginning of the act, speaking to Torvald, she says, this is the first Christmas we don't need to save. A few pages later, Helmer says, if you really could hold on to the money I give you, but it'll go towards one useless thing after another, and then I'll have to fork out again. And he says to her also, you're a strange little one, just as your father was. And this is all around the subject of money. So notice one thing they talk about when they talk about time, they're also talking about money and spending. Nora's talking about how in the past they've had to struggle, but now they have money. And as Helmer points out, actually, to be more precise, in the future, in the very near future, they will have more money. And Helmer, in speaking about money, he knows because it's happened before. This is a recurrent pattern. He gives her money, she spends it, he has to give her more, which is just what her father did. She's repeating the, the behavior of the past and the behavior of her father. So in talking about time, both in terms of they're talking about the past and the future, you hear both of them, we see the subject of money, of spending, and the influence of past and heredity on the characters. And that's, of course, going to be an important part of their relationship and the breakdown of that relationship. In a conversation with Mrs. Linda, her friend, Nora says, is it nine years since we saw each other? Or is it eight to nine years? Oh, these last eight years have been a happy time, she says. Mrs. Linda, when Nora talks about money, she says, Nora, you've not grown sensible yet. Back at school, you were a big spendthrift. And Nora talking about, after she reveals to, to Mrs. Linda that she surreptitiously, secretly took out a loan, to support Torvald, she says, perhaps one day I'll tell Torvald about the loan, many years from now, when I'm no longer as pretty. So, again, talking about time, the characters are talking about time in this uh, explicitly, but what ideas are coming up? What conflicts do we see between characters? Well, we see the contrast between Nora's happiness, or at least her profession of happiness, with Christine's tragedy. She's a widower, or she's a widow, excuse me, and a widow from a marriage that wasn't even a happy marriage. And it also shows us Nora's childishness versus Christine's maturity. Nora is still the way she was back in school, whereas Christine, Linda, has had to grow up because she's had a more difficult life. And again, as with the uh, previous uh, moment, but with the conversation with Nora and Torvald, we see that Nora's repeating patterns about money. So also we get the idea of the passage of time and, and transformation over time. Mrs. Linda has transformed a lot, but Nora maybe hasn't transformed quite as much. Although, of course, there is the mention, as she, as she reveals to Mrs. Linda, that she has her own secrets, the first of which, as we find out here, is the loan. A little bit later on in, in Act 1, Krogstad says to Nora, after he reveals that he knows she forged her father's signature, you were committing fraud against me. The thing I once did was equivalent, and it wrecked my entire social standing. And he also says, if, you, if I produce this document in court, you will be condemned according to the law. And near the end of the scene, Helmer talking about Krogstad and his influence on his own children, he says, such an atmosphere of lies that is, that Krogstad never admitted to his crime. Such an atmosphere of lies brings contagion and disease. Every breath the children take in such a house is filled with the germs of something ugly. So Krogstad talks about the crimes of the past, the crimes that he committed that ruined his social standing, and the crimes that Nora has committed that he is willing to reveal, to blackmail her if he needs to, and the dangers of the future. If you don't do what I say, you will be condemned. Nora is now has this fear. What will happen to her in the future? If she goes against Krogstad, she will be condemned. And she also fears what 
will my influence be on my children? What will happen to them? Are they breathing in the contagion and disease from my crime? Will I pass on my crime to them in the way that it's been suggested that she inherited her, her uh, uh, childishness and her uh, bad money management skills from her own father? Let's talk about space, some of the references to space in Act One. In the very beginning, in the stage directions, we're told that it is a comfortably and tastefully, though not expensively, furnished room. And when Mrs. Linda arrives, Nora says to her, now we'll sit ourselves comfortably here by the stove. No, in the armchair there. I'll sit here in the rocking chair. So these are, it's very simple, but just it creates an atmosphere. This is a homey place. We're in a home, a domestic space. And these are people with taste, even though they don't necessarily have a lot of money. So it's comfortable, but not wealthy. And it's a private space, an intimate space, yet also welcoming, at least to certain people. So this tells us about their family, who Nora and Torvald are, what kind of people they are, and perhaps what their aspirations are. It's tasteful, but not expensive. They are coming into money. These are going to be the kind of people who are likely to uh, very quickly show that they have money. They're going to re, uh, redecorate. Helmer, when he uh, when the play begins, he's in his study and uh, hearing Nora, he says, do not disturb, but then a moment later opens the door to his study to come, come out. And later when Dr. Rank arrives, he says, did the doctor go straight into my study? We actually don't see Dr. Rank arrive. We just know that he's gone into Helmer's study and is waiting for him in there. So the study is a space that at least in the play, when it's performed on stage, we never get access to. In film versions, you can show the space, nor can it even go in and out of the space. But in the play, as it's written, it's a masculine exclusive space. It's the husband's study. Nora doesn't go in there. Other women don't go in there. Servants are excluded, except unless they're invited in or told to go in and clean. It is a, spe a special masculine space excluded from the stage, ex excluded from representation. So this, I think also, tells us a little bit about the gender dynamic, the relationships, who has power in this family, who has their own place, who has a room of their own, and who doesn't. And a little bit later in the scene, when Krogstad returns a second time to confront Nora, the stage direction says, meanwhile, someone has been knocking on the door. Nobody has noticed. Now the door is pushed ajar and Krogstad appears. He waits a little. The game continues. So this is just stage directions and reading it, it it's very easy to, to gloss over it. But if we can imagine what's happening, this is, notice, if you remember, this is when Nora's playing with her children. She's in this moment of happiness. Krogstad is looming behind her. We as the audience can see him standing in the doorway menacingly. Krogstad has already been introduced as someone somewhat unsavory that the, that the other characters react in a negative way to. So his appearance in the doorway, like a like a uh, an intruder, an invader, he's invading the private space. And it just visually, again, we have to imagine it if we're only reading, but the visual tells us a great deal about what's going on, that he is invading her world, that he is not wanted there, and that he is a threat to her domestic bliss, to her little family that she's created, uh, her life as happy mother playing with her children. Krogstad is the dangerous invader. And this also suggests to us then, even though we are located uh, in the play only in this one room, even though that's all we see on stage, that space is not uh, hermetically sealed. It's not sealed off from the outside world. It may, Nora wants her home to be a sanctuary, as, as all people do, but even in this space, she's not fully safe. Someone from outside can come in and intrude upon her space and safety. So thinking about these, these uh, issues, they give us a lot of, or these moments in the play, they give us a lot of different topics that we can explore. Right? They, they bring up the questions of wealth and social class and its relationship to identity and how characters relate to each other and identify each other based on their social class. The influence of the past on the present, both characters' expectations, the theme of heredity, how one's parents 
uh, behaviors shape the child and, and have consequences for the child and consequences, legal, moral, ethical consequences of one's actions. The characters, we might say one thing that's happening in this play is many of the characters are having to face the consequences of their actions. We also see the economic pressure on the home and family that despite this picture of this perfect little doll's house that we're watching, this domestic bliss that we see unfolding, uh, there is this outside pressure. There is the real world, we might say. There's the, the world of the economy, the world of material survival. And Krogstad represents uh, in some way perhaps the invasion of that economic pressure into the home. Nora owes him money. The separation of male and female spaces, which physically enacts the, the influence or the, the separation between the genders in a psychological or, or uh, uh, power, in terms of power and authority. And we can see how this influences different individuals and shapes the conflict, generates conflict between them because they are excluded, because they are differentiated and perhaps lack a certain understanding of each other. And we might think about the possibilities for individual change and development. What enables a character to change and develop? What are the, the, the uh, events and experiences that cause one to mature in this world? Why has Nora changed or not changed over her life? What has limited her development? What does she need in order to become more fully a person? So let's finish by talking about next steps. Of course, you should go back through act one, think about the structure, think about time and space and how they uh, come up as topics in the play, both in terms of the literal time and space that's unfolding and how the characters talk about and think about time and space and their position, the effects of the past on the present and future. And then going in, into acts two and three, continue to look for mentions of past experiences and, and what are their consequences for the present? In particular, the issue of heredity and the influence of the parents on the children. That's a topic that, that recurs. In act two, think about Anne Marie, the maid, and her talk about her past experiences. Dr. Rank and the discussion of Dr. Rank's father and his past. And also, of course, crimes of the past, the way an individual's crimes not only affect themselves and their, uh, but also, of course, their, their future families, their future children. And secrets, what secrets from the past are revealed. Dr. Rank's secrets. Mrs. Linda and Krogstad's secrets, what secrets are revealed and how do those events affect what we're seeing in the moment now? Predictions for the future. What are the characters' dangers? What are the fears? What are their hopes? Again, the, the idea of heredity and the influence of parents on children. What is Nora's fear about her influence on her children? What does Torvald say when he ultimately finds out about Nora's actions and what are his fears of her influence? And what are the possibilities that the characters have for escape or redemption? Does Nora have hope for the future? What gives her hope? What does she hope will happen? What is the event that would change her life that would solve the problem that she's going through? If you look at the stage directions, you'll see that at Acts 2 and 3, at the beginning, the, the stage itself has been reset. The decorations are changed somewhat. Some items of furniture are moved about, removed, etc. So in the changes in setting, what does that tell us that's happened between the acts? What's happened in between acts one and two and acts two and three? What's changed then in the character's situations? How has that passage of time uh, heightened the conflict or changed the character's needs? or push them to certain uh, decisions. And what events are we shown and not shown? Again, there's a Christmas celebration, there's a Christmas party. Are we shown these events and why not? And also in the changes in setting, what future actions are set up? That is looking at the stage, looking at how the furniture is moved about, what do we expect will happen? How does the furniture, uh, how do the characters adapt to the changed space? For example, if you come into class and you see that the, ta the desks are all uh, moved around into a circle, then you know a certain kind of action is going to be happening. The class is set up for something different than if all the desks are in rows facing forward. So how does the change in the setting influence and shape what's going to happen between the characters? 
So now just a couple of final thoughts. Of course, there's a great deal more that we could talk about, but I wanted to give you some basic concepts to think about time and, and space, to think about setting, really, uh, uh, the setting of the plot and how the plot is structured in time and space. My, my two main takeaways here really are that, one, that every element in a play can be the subject of interpretation. Every aspect of it can be the starting point for questions and investigation and understanding. And two, I wanted you to think about time and space both as the literal limits of the narrative, as the way the, the plot unfolds, but also as concepts and themes within the narrative that define the story and that are part of the lives and conflicts of the characters. So with that in mind, I will say goodbye. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or put a comment on this video. I will see you in the next uh, video, or if you're my student, I may see you in class. Otherwise, have a great day and hope to see you again. Thanks very much.